Welcome to the July edition of the Home Setting Academy. And this is a subject that I'm very much interested in. Um, we're fortunate enough today to have Sarah Johnson, whose title is Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the National Weather Service. And weather is something all of us who raise plants were constantly looking at. So it's always so what I thought we could do today is Sarah's going to give us a presentation on the the weather forecasts and resources that are available from the National Weather Service. So I don't want to take away from your time. I'm sure you'll have lots of questions on this. What we usually do is we ask people to put their questions in the chat and then we'll go through them at the end to make it easier so we don't interrupt you. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. Um, great to be here. Um, and glad that the weather cooperated too, so that we could have a quiet weather day to, to, for me to give this, unlike the last couple of days. Um, but uh, thank you all. Um, so um, first, before I get kind of get into what resources are available, I just want to talk about the National Weather Service, because um, not everyone is familiar exactly what the National Weather Service is and how it fits into the broader weather enterprise. Um, we are a um, part of the federal government. Um, and fun fact, speaking about, you know, the importance of weather and agriculture and uh, farming, um, the Weather Service has been around in one form or another since 1870. It started off in the, um, as the U.S. Army Signal Corps, but when it first became a part of a civilian agency in the 1890s, it was placed under the Department of Agriculture because the largest user group of that, at that time of weather forecast was, of course, the agriculture section. Uh, we eventually got into the Department of Commerce when uh, the burgeoning um, uh, aviation industry became a, um, a uh, bigger, uh, another user in, in our uh, uh, resources. And that was the precursor to the FAA was in the Department of Commerce. So that's how we got in there. But uh, we are still in the Department of Commerce. Uh, you may hear NOAA also uh, in reference to the National Weather Service. Um, that's our umbrella agency. Um, we are part of the a larger weather enterprise, so there are obviously lots of private companies um, that provide weather forecasts uh, and information, as well as broadcast um, channels as well. Um, uh, so we are, uh, all of our stuff is, is pretty much free of charge because we are a part of the federal, uh, uh, federal government. Um, we don't compete with the private sector. A lot of the private sector may uh, have very more specific um, forecasts and thresholds for, for some of their paying customers. Um, but the one thing that uh, you all have probably all used uh, with the National Weather Service is um, we are the official um, issu issuers of any watch warnings or advisories. Um, so anytime you've heard a winter storm watch or a tornado warning, uh, or something like that, that's generally coming from the National Weather Service. Some of these private agencies may issue um, watches and warnings for some of their paying customers, but um, but official watches and warnings uh, come from our agency. Um, here is a look at our office. So uh, my office is um, in Burlington County. Um, it's in, well, our mailing address is Mount Holly, but we're technically in West Hampton. Um, our office, we'll talk more about exactly where we cover, uh, but New Jersey is covered by two different um, local forecast offices. You have our office um, in the Mount Holly, West Hampton area, and we cover most of New Jersey. And then you have an office that's on Long Island that covers uh, the five counties in Northeast New Jersey as a part of the bigger um, North New York City uh, Metroplex. Uh, but this is a look at our office, a look at our operations floor. We are a 24 seven operation um, because of course you never know, can't, can't exactly schedule weather. So uh, we work rotating shifts here. Um, always have at least two people on duty at all times, um, unless there is active weather, in which case you may have upwards of nine or 10 people uh, in this area that uh, is pictured here. Uh, we are a local forecast office, uh, and this kind of gives you an idea of where all the local forecast offices are. They cover, there's a 122 of them covering all 50 states as well as the U.S. territories. Uh, but the way the National Weather Service is structured, I, I use a medical analogy to describe it. Um, we have local forecast offices. We are kind of like our general, general practitioners. Uh, we cover a limited geographical area. 
Uh, you can see our office is actually labeled as the Philadelphia office, but that's our office. And you can see the area that we cover there, most of New Jersey, all of Delaware, a few counties in Maryland and southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, uh, but so we cover any kind of weather that comes to this area. Um, uh, we cover it, but we have a limited ge geographical area. But within the National Weather Service, there are national centers that are kind of like the specialists going with the medical analogy, um, which we defer to some of their expertise. Um, and two of the probably most famous um, national centers are the National Hurricane Center, which a lot of people have heard about uh, by, by the name, you might imagine. They, they focus on uh, hurricanes, tropical cyclones. And Storm Prediction Center, their focus is on fire weather as well as uh, severe storms. Um, so um, that's kind of the National Weather Service in a nutshell. Um, but now kind of getting into um, what I think is probably going to be uh, of most interest um, is what kind of products, services, and resources are there available to you and at what time ranges? Um, so I have this structure going from long range to, um, to shorter range uh, services. And we'll talk about the differences. And this is where uh, a handout was sent out ahead of this um, call um, that has all of these links. So I don't want you to have to like hurriedly be writing down these, um, these URLs because um, uh, I'm going to be kind of switching at back and forth between my, um, between my presentation as well as going and just kind of showing you some of these, um, some of these websites. So um, all of these links are that I'm going to be going through are hyperlinked in the handout that was sent out. Um, so first, we're going to start with long range products and services. These are these long range outlooks um, are any what we consider long range is anything beyond day seven. That is not handled as much by my office. Going back to, uh, you know, our national centers, our specialists, there is a national center called the Climate Prediction Center that is specifically focused on. Uh, these long-range outlooks. Um, the key thing to know when we're talking about all these um, products and services and resources is as you get further out in time, uh, further lead time, you're going to have much less detail. Um, it's probably, if it's an outlook covering a hazard, it's going to be covering a broader area um, uh, than, than what may actually happen. Um, and so let me just go ahead and go to um, the Climate Prediction Center website. Um, can you all see the website now instead of my um, slideshow? Looks good. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so again, this is a national center, uh, the Climate Prediction Center, they focus on long range outlooks. Um, and this is their homepage. And uh, some key things, the, a lot of the key products are right here on the front page, the home page. Um, so um, you know, look here. And since we were talking about the, um, the, the uh, um, uh, farm fair coming up, let's go ahead and take a look at the um, eight to 14 day outlook. Um, so this would be an outlook uh, that's in the two week time period. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, you have these at different time scales. You have it at six to 10, eight to 14 days, um, weeks three and four. You also have one month outlook, three month outlooks. Um, so we'll take a look here and we'll just go to an example here. So this is the interactive um, for the interactive uh, view. You can also see static images. Um, and the first thing you'll notice is that uh, on these outlooks, it only has two um, elements. It has temperatures, which is what is up here, shown up here in the top, and then it has precipitation. Um, it, it doesn't tell you what kind of precipitation, which of course is not a big deal in the summer, but we get this question a lot in the wintertime. So how much snow is gonna be happening in week two? Uh, this is not gonna tell you how much of this precipitation and falling is gonna be snow. Uh, it's just precipitation in general. Um, and so you can see, we'll just use this as an example. Again, this would be the two-week outlook um, in, the, in the Burlington County area. Um, and um, you can see the uh, up here at the top, the um, temperature outlook is for a 39% chance for above normal um, temperatures. 
33% chance of near normal temperatures and then below normal is 28%. So what that says is that we have slightly better chances for above normal temperatures. Um, yeah, in other words, hot, because we're getting into uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, we're getting into what climatologically, what our average temperatures are the highest that they are of the year. Um, so it's, it's looking like going towards the um, uh, middle to latter part of July, where we're looking at um, um, above normal, above what our normals, which are already pretty high, are. Um, and then you look down here at precipitation, you see the chances for above, below, and near normal precipitation are all pretty much equal, 33 to 34%. All that means is that there isn't really a strong signal one way or the other with precipitation. We don't look, doesn't look like we're getting into a um, um, period where we have especially active, a lot of storm systems coming up our way. Um, in other words, it's just there's no more strong signal one way or the other. So that's kind of how to read these um, uh, these outlooks. And like I said, you can see them for different um, different time periods: six to ten, eight to fourteen day, three to four uh, week, and then one month and then three months. Now the key thing to know about once we get into uh, the three month outlooks and even the one month outlooks is that these are going to be talking about on average for the period that you're talking. So if in the three month outlook, um, again, pull this up and we'll just, um, we'll pick a different place. We'll pick Trenton this time. So on average over the uh, July, August, September time period, um, you can see there are 59% chance for above normal temperatures. Um, no question, very strong signal that we're going to see above normal temperatures. Now, does this mean that within the next three months, we're not going to have one week where we are below normal? Absolutely not. Um, this is talking about on average over the, the whole three month period, um, we're looking at above normal, temp uh, better chance for above normal temperatures. Um, so that's the key thing to note is that, you know, just because uh, the three month outlook is, uh, a strong signal for above normal temperatures doesn't mean you can't have the opposite um, in a smaller time period within that period. Um, that is the heart of a lot of these outlooks, uh, but there are a couple other handy outlooks to look at on this page. Um, for the uh, key one is uh, eight to 14 day hazards. So this is looking at hazardous weather, and you can see the it broken down there by temperatures, both excessive heat and as well as extreme cold. Uh, if we were in the winter time, um, precipitation are we looking at it, a um, uh, patterns where there's potential for uh, excessive rainfall to the point of flash flooding? Snow, obviously, there is no concern about that right now. Um, and then wind. Um, are not not talking about thunderstorm winds, but talking about um, broader system winds when we might have a wind advisory or a high wind warning. Um, like uh, that's that tends to be more of a cold season hazard than a warm season hazard, especially for us. So no surprise, we don't have a lot of outlooks there. And you can see right now in the eight to fourteen day um, outlook, um, really not looking at any. Um, uh, any major um, concerns in the, the two-week period for our region. Um, now, what exactly is defined as excessive heat? Because we talked about, you know, there is a risk that we could have above normal temperatures. But when we talk about excessive heat, we're talking about to a point of we think that, that we'll need a um, excessive heat warning or a heat advisory. Um, so that's, you know, to the point of where it's becoming especially unhealthy. Um, you can see Again, when we talk about the further out you are, uh, the less detail um, that you're going to see. And you can see here, looking at this 8 to 14 day hazards outlook, you can see it has excessive heat outlooked for pretty much the whole southwestern U.S. going down into Texas and uh, Louisiana. That's a broad area. We're not necessarily going to see excessive heat warnings for that entire region. Again, further out you are, the broader it's going to be and the less detailed it's going to be. Um, I'm going to take a minute here to talk about what exactly are they 
do forecasters at the Climate Prediction Center look at when they are looking at these long range outlooks? Um, they're going to be looking at overall patterns. Uh, so, you know, if we have the larger scale weather pattern, if we have a large trough over our region, typically that's going to mean that we have um, below normal temperatures and may have more active in terms of uh, precipitation, in terms of storm tracks, et cetera. Um, so they're going to be looking at, that's one thing they can look at in the two to three week time frame, even getting into the four week time frame. Um, but you don't have a whole lot of lead time with that. You can also look at some um, what we call teleconnections, um, the most famous of which is uh, what is officially known um, as the uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation, uh, or it, so El Nino, La Nina, or Inso Neutral, depending on what, what um, stage we are in. This is looking at what water temperatures are in the equatorial Pacific. And we're talking about the Pacific Ocean, a long ways away from here. But believe it or not, that can have implications for uh, the weather in our region um, and even in broader areas. Um, and we are right now in an El Nino, uh, in fact, a strengthening El Nino pattern um, that doesn't have a lot of impact locally on our weather patterns in the summertime. There's a lot more of a correlation when we go into the cold season, uh, late fall, winter, and into early spring. Um, but it does have an impact on uh, that we're in El Nino. That tends to mean that even though this is something that happens in the Pacific, that tends to mean less favorable um, conditions for tropical development in the Atlantic. Um, so that that is that is one area where it does have an impact in the warm season. Um, and we'll talk more about tropical outlooks in a little bit. Um, but Along with ENSO, that is the most famous, uh, but you can see up here in the uh, left-hand corner, if you really want to get into the nitty-gritty details, I'm not going to go into all of these, uh, but if you really want to get into the nitty-gritty nitty, nitty details, there are other oscillations um, in addition to El Nino La Nina, including one that's much closer to us called the Northern Atlantic Oscillation, or NAO, um, and this page has a lot of more information on those. Um, you don't hear as much about the NAO because there isn't as long of a lead time as to, um, you know, being able to predict this on a seasonal level. Um, it's typically something that happens more on a, in terms of weeks versus months with the uh, El Nino, La Nina. Um, so that's another big factor of things that they look at. Um, there are also some very long range model uh, forecasts um, that, um, uh, go into um, um, longer range, uh, but um, uh, the main things uh, that they're looking at are the oscillations as well as the um, general weather patterns. So um, again, very quick, um, quick uh, detail about long range outlooks. Um, one thing you probably saw while I was going through the CPC page there um, that I didn't talk about yet, which I'm going to save for the end because um, it's a whole other topic in and of itself, is that this page will also be where you find information about drought, both drought monitoring, the current state of drought, as well as what the outlooks are. And so we'll talk about that um, towards the end. Now let's talk about some of the products, services, and resources that are in uh, the next seven days. So just looking within the next week, what is available? Um, we talked about long range outlooks. There are outlooks in this the days one through seven as well. Um, and now here we start to get into an even more tiered system. Um, we, I've already thrown around the terms watch and warning and what's the difference between those. Uh, watch means conditions are favorable for hazardous weather um, to be met, be it a winter storm, be it um, severe thunderstorm, Whatever we're warning for, or whatever we're, we're sending out the watch for, it just means conditions are favorable. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's imminent or that we have high confidence in it. Uh, typically, a watch will be issued up to a few days in advance for some of our longer developing um, hazards like winter weather, um, wind, uh, heat, cold. Generally, you're talking that the watches may be issued uh, one to two 
and occasionally three days in advance. When we're talking about severe thunderstorm watches and tornado watches, uh, that's a different story because so many different elements have to come together just right for to produce severe thunderstorms or tornadoes. Um, generally, those watches are only going to be issued two to six hours in advance of any storms developing. Once the hazardous weather has developed, or we have very high confidence that it is imminent, it is about to develop, then a warning or an advisory will be issued. Um, so, you know, severe thunderstorm warning, winter storm warning, whatever that warning is for, that means either we already have reports of it, it's already occurring, or it is about to occur um, and you need to take protective action. Now, the difference between a warning and advisory, and I'll caveat this initially by saying this is all going to change within a few years. Uh, based on social science, we know there's a lot of um, confusion when it comes to the advisory label. Um, so eventually this is going to be going away um, and we're going to replace it with some statements that are just plain language statements. But um, for now, since this is the system we have in place for now, uh, advisory means that there's weather, there's weather out there that if you don't take precautions, it can be hazardous, um, but it's not expected to reach warning criteria. And the best um, illustration of this is, let's talk about snow. If we get two to three inches of snow, that's going to be a problem. You know, it's it's going to be a challenge for commutes. We want, we'll want to put some, add in some extra time on our commutes. Um, and if you're probably not going to be driving at the speed limits, you might need to slow down a little bit. But it's probably not going to be a level of snow that's going to be crippling for our region. Versus eight inches of snow, well, that's a bigger deal, right? That could be closing things down. That could be causing issues with power, um, power grids, et cetera. So the eight inches of snow would be a winter storm warning. The two to three inches of snow, that would be a, probably be a winter weather advisory. Um, so I just want to emphasize what the difference between advisory and warning is there. Um, so again, going from furthest out to closest end, um, we have outlooks um, that this is this would be issued up to seven days in advance, depending on the hazard, um, and would be issued well even if we don't have enough confidence, uh, well before we have enough confidence to issue a watch. Um, we do have a one-stop shop. This is out. This is uh, hyperlinked on your um, on your handout there. For any kind of hazardous weather, you can see it's on a um, um, color-coded system, um, red usually meaning bad, red or purple meaning kind of the worst, um, green meaning good, yellow meaning um, you're starting to get into the caution phase. Um, I'll just take you there just to kind of show you. Um, and this is for the... Um, Mount Holly, the Mount Holly West Hampton office um, or Northeast New Jersey, you would just go to this one, uh, which is for our sister office up on Long Island. Um, again, you can see it's the exact same information, um, just depending on the different um, area that you're covering. Um, and then you can hover over. Um, it's going to default on the left hand side here with what is the highest risk in this case. Uh, because we still have additional uh, chances for showers and thunderstorms, uh, especially Thursday. Lightning is going to be our biggest risk. Um, but you can see we also have some risk there for severe thunderstorm, excessive rainfall, um, and somewhat for wind right along the coast. Um, but that's a pretty low risk at this point. Sorry, my... Zoom controls are hiding my tabs, so I have to keep going back and forth. So my apologies if you keep seeing my desktop. Um, there are specialized outlooks. So what I just showed you is kind of a one-stop shop for all kinds of outlooks, but then there are a specialized outlooks specifically for severe thunderstorm. Um, and that looks like this. Um, uh, this is an example from um, June 3rd, 2020, um, I actually um, borrowed this from one of our neighboring offices, but uh, it was a similar case to us. If you don't remember, this was, we had a derecho come through about midday on June 3rd, primarily for South Jersey. 
Um, and then we had a little bit of a lull, and then we had additional severe thunderstorms in the late afternoon and evening. And that gives you an example of uh, uh, the outlook that we had going into that. Uh, the key thing to know is it's it's a one through five uh, tiered category here, um, going from marginal risk, um, slight risk, enhanced, moderate, and high risk. Marginal risk, very common for our area. In fact, we have a marginal risk for severe storms on Thursday. Um, slight risk, uh, it's it's certainly not unusual here. Um, uh, it, it's it's not, it, it, we have had some as recently as just within the last few days. Enhanced risk. Now for our region, you're starting to get into something that is a little more unusual for, um, for, for our part of the, the, the country. And it's exceedingly rare that we will get a moderate or a high risk of severe thunderstorms. And the reason is this is a scale that is for the whole country. So the setup that you would need to get a high risk is typically what you're going to see um, when you're talking about Tornado Alley in the Midwest um, or in the uh, Deep South, where they're more prone to get these big, huge tornado outbreaks. Um, so I just want to emphasize that, that don't dismiss a severe thunderstorm outlook if it's only a slight or only an enhanced. That's still a pretty big deal for us. Um, so keep that in mind. Much like very similar to the severe thunderstorm outlook, we also have an excessive rainfall outlook. Um, that again, this is for a national scale. It goes from marginal slight, excuse me, marginal slight, moderate, and high. Um, and um, here's a whoops, sorry. Here's an example from September 1st, 2021. If that uh, date doesn't stick out in your mind, this was when the remnants of Ida came through our region, uh, producing um, some very severe flooding, especially for central and northern Jersey, um, but also had some, some flooding uh, down in South Jersey, as well as some tornadoes. Uh, but um, you can see we had the high risk out there um, for portions of New Jersey um, uh, during the um, during the flooding. Um, just to give you as an FYI, for portions of our region on Sunday, just this you know two days ago, uh, when we had all that um, those thunderstorms, we had a moderate risk for much of the region except Southeast Jersey, where there was um, a slight risk, I believe. Um, other outlooks. Um, we have the uh, river flood outlook. Um, this is put put on by our um, uh, a sister office in State College. They are the Mid Atlantic River Forecast Center. They just focus on hydrology forecasts, so just on the river levels um, for. Um, and I'll, I'll click on this. You can see there's really no significant river flooding expected right now. Um, thankfully, because uh, we're still trying to dry out from Sunday. Um, but for much of New Jersey, the 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 uh, main 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 people that would be concerned about this is if you're close to one of our major waterways, including like Raritan, Passaic, um, even Rancocas Creek is covered by their river forecasts. Um, those and Delaware, uh, of course, Delaware River, uh, where it is not tidal, is also covered. Um, another one, let's talk about the tropics. Um, tropical outlook. So uh, here's the tropical outlook. Um, this is seven day tropical outlook. Um, and the uh, X you see there is where there is a location of a current disturbance. Um, and then that hatched area is where that current disturbance, where if it's going to form into a tropical system, where it may form into a tropical system. That doesn't necessarily mean once it develops into a tropical system, which way will it be moving. Uh, but that just means the potential formation area of a tropical system. And then it's further color coded. Uh, yellow meaning a low risk, orange as this one is meaning a medium risk, and then if it was red, that would mean a high risk of development. Um, and you can see here if I hover over it, uh, you would be able to see um, the discussion about it. 
so this one within the next seven days has a 50% chance uh, for development. Um, you can see well, well off the coast there. Um, and now we get into watches again. I already kind of talked about this, you know, about the uh, watch just means that conditions are favorable and we have a confidence of at least 50%. Um, you can see a meme down there in the lower right hand corner. Think of whatever your favorite food is. And a watch just means you have the ingredients together, but it hasn't been mixed, it hasn't been baked, whatever the case may be. Uh, that's the watch. Once, once you actually have that cupcake in this case, uh, that then that would be what would be a warning. Um, and we've already talked mostly about the the warnings. So again, just to kind of emphasize what would um, uh, the difference between an outlook watch and warning. An outlook, for example, in here we're going to be talking about severe thunderstorms. It could cover multiple states, a very broad area. A watch. Uh, we're starting to talk about narrowing it down, but it still is going to be covering multiple counties, at least, if not multiple states. And finally, warning, we actually have a storm that has developed. Um, and in the case of a severe thunderstorm warning, um, that may not even cover an entire county. It may only be portions of a county um, that would be covered by a, a warning. Um, one thing I do want to talk about briefly, when we talk about the severe thunderstorm outlook, um, a lot of people are surprised to know that when we're talking about thunderstorm outlooks, lightning is not a um, criterion for a severe thunderstorm watch or warning. Um, the criterion you can see there, uh, hail of at least an inch or larger, so that means about the size of a quarter or larger, um, a 58 mile per hour wind gusts. That seems like an arbitrary number, but I'll get back to that. And of course, anything, any uh, severe thunderstorm, any thunderstorm that produces a tornado is considered severe. So why do we have the criteria that we do of one inch in diameter for hail and 58 mile per hour wind? Well, we are tr constantly trying to walk a fine line to uh, make sure that we're warning people about the most severe um, events without overwarning people to the point of they start ignoring severe thunderstorm warnings or ignoring whatever the warning may be. And so for that case, uh, and for that reason, we've set these criteria where they are. Uh, when you start to get to one inch in diameter hail, that's when you start to see more significant damage to um, vehicles and roofs. And so that's why it's set at that point. Not to say that you can't have crop damage at um, hail sizes lower, but again, we're you know we're trying to walk the fine line and making sure people are warned about the most um, hazardous stuff without being uh, so saturated with warnings uh, that they ignore them. Same thing with the 58 mile per hour wind gust. That's at that level, you start to see more significant tree damage um, and can start to see things like individual roof shingles blown off. Um, or um, some siding blown off. Um, you can see minor tree damage at speeds lower than that. And you can see some things like um, trampolines is a big thing. We, we get lots of reports about trampolines being blown around uh, because those act like a sail. And uh, you know it's a big sail on a um, relatively lightweight frame. So if it's not secured, those things can go flying in, in 58, in like 40 mile per hour winds, um, well below severe criteria. Um, so just wanted to give you guys a heads up of when we're when you're looking at a severe weather outlook or a, or a severe thunderstorm watch uh, or warning, this is what we are uh, concerned about. Um, briefly talk about flood warnings. Uh, especially because it is so um, uh, relevant given what we ha just happened two days ago. Um, there are different types of flooding. You have flash flooding, you have flooding or aerial flooding, and then you have river flooding. River flooding is the easiest to describe. This is talking about flooding that is just happening along those uh, major waterways in our area. I, I listed some of the most major ones. There are some others uh, in the region, but we're just talking about 
the flooding in the immediate vicinity um, along the banks, along the floodplains of these uh, of these waterways. Flash flooding can happen anywhere, uh, and aerial flooding they can happen anywhere. Doesn't matter how close you are to the nearest creek or river, uh, you can still get flooding. The, the the saying is, if it can rain where you are, it can flood where you are. Um, the difference between flash flooding and aerial flooding or just flooding is just the difference in how quickly it develops. Flash flooding is something that is happening within six hours of the causative event. A causative event, vast majority of the time in our region, is going to mean uh, heavy rain, heavy rain leading to flash flooding. So flash flooding just means flooding that is developed within six hours of the um, of the heavy rain occurring, whereas aerial flooding or flooding is more slow to develop. Uh, it may be that we've had multiple days of very light, gentle rain, um, and um, it's, you know, it, we're getting more, again, light rain or um, um, starting to see some snow melt on top of an already saturated ground. It's just going to be developing a little bit slower. Uh, if you're not familiar with our main website, if you go to weather.gov, not weather.com, that's the weather channel, but weather.gov is us. Uh, that will take you to this main website. Um, and uh, as with advisories, I do want to add the caveat that this is all going to change. We are totally revamping our website um, and hope to have a brand new website experience within the next um, two years or so. Uh, but in the meantime, um, from this main page, if you just click on the part of uh, New Jersey you're in, it will take you to either the main page for um, our office here in uh, Mount Holly, West Hampton, or if you clicked uh, on Northeast New Jersey, it would take you to the website for, um, for our sister office on Long Island. Uh, they look very similar. Um, from here, you can click directly on the map to where uh, you live, and it will take you to a what we call our point and click forecast, which is our de detailed public forecast. You can also see down here where we have specific forecasts um, for various hazards, rivers and lakes, coastal flooding, um, for any of you that may live near a tidal waterway or near the coast. Um, graphical hazards, this is what I showed you before with our graphical hazardous weather outlook. Um, so um, not going to get too much into detail on that or the river forecasts. Um, so I do want to make sure I leave plenty of time for quest for questions. Um, and then ways to receive our, our uh, watches, warnings, and advisories. Uh, in addition to the website, um, there are multiple ways to receive our watches, warnings, and advisories. One of the um, um, one, one of the methods that's been around almost the longest is weather radio. You can buy special radios that uh, have a weather band in addition, it'd be like an addition to an AM band, FM band, um, that you can tune into uh, our, a weather, weather radio station. You can program, almost all weather radios that you can buy now can be programmed so that they can, even if you don't aren't actively listening to it, it can alert um, send off an alert tone when there is a um, warning uh, that is issued for your county or your forecast area. Um, you know, so it, it's a great way to get a lot of our watches and warnings. Like think, for example, if there was a tornado warning that was issued at two o'clock in the morning, some of the usual methods that you might use to get that information, be it checking online or watching the news, you're probably not going to be in tune with that if you're asleep. Uh, so uh, this is a great way. Um, but you can also, of course, get all of our watches, warnings information from uh, commercial media, both TV and, and radio, um, as well as websites. There's plenty of third-party apps as well. Um, there's also something called the Wireless Emergency Alert. This is something that is uh, about 10 years old. And not all of our warnings, but our most severe warnings will activate on any uh, WIA enabled smartphone. Uh, you, if you have a smartphone, I'm sure you, you do not forget the sound that it makes. It's not just weather alerts, it's also amber alerts, law enforcement alerts, a whole bunch of other things. 
Um, it's actually a system through FEMA, uh, but they relay, again, some of our warnings. Um, and you can see the warnings on the right-hand side there that get relayed through there. So you're not going to know all of them, but that is another way uh, to learn about um, some of the, the most severe warnings. All right. Um, so before I go on to questions, I, as promised, I was going to get back to um, drought. Um, because as I mentioned, that's kind of a whole nother topic. So uh, drought information, again, going back to the Climate Prediction Center website, um, down here in the lower left corner, um, first thing you see is monitor. Um, and clicking on this will take you to what is the current state of the drought. Um, and as you can see, for uh, much of New Jersey, we are either in D0, which just means abnormally dry. You can see the um, legend down here, or D1, which is a moderate drought. And you can click, uh, keep clicking to zoom in further and further if you want to see exactly what the state of drought is um, across New Jersey. Also, on that may on this Climate Prediction Center page. In addition to the current conditions, there is also an outlook for the month as well as an outlook for the season. Um, and I'll just click on the seasonal outlook here. Uh, now these are not; these are only updated once a month. Um, you can so you can see the the uh, this is the seasonal outlook was updated June thirtieth, um, and the color coding here is referencing either brown drought persisting. Um, Drought remains, but some improvement for that kind of tannish color. Um, green, drought removal likely, and yellow, drought development likely. Um, so that just kind of gives you an idea of, um, of what the outlooks look there. Now that is going to be using um, some of the same detail that they get from, the, um, from these longer range outlooks when they're looking at the precipitation. Um, it's going to be using some of that information but it's also going to be looking at uh, drought is not just about the rainfall deficit, but also about uh, the impacts to agriculture, to uh, water supply um, uh, issues, those kinds of things. So it's it's more than just considering the uh, rainfall deficit uh, when we're talking about drought. And so with that, I will go ahead and open it up to questions. Um, again, a lot of the everything I talked about is hyperlinked on the the um, handout. But if you have any questions at all, you're more than welcome to email me. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, a lot of new information for me, a lot of new resources, and it looks like it has sparked some uh, interesting questions in the chat for you. So uh, we can go ahead and get started with the questions. Um, the first question is from Leslie. She was wondering about, uh, you know, the outlook for hurricanes, which you kind of um, yeah. touched yeah, on. So, so we're good. Yeah, she she covered it. I will say, I'm, I'm looking at your question now, Leslie. And and so, the, yeah, there is a separate outlook for how um, tropical storms develop. That being said, tropical storms, as we know, unfortunately, from the last couple of years, can bring severe weather. And so the severe weather outlook will include any additional risk of uh, severe thunderstorms due to tropical systems. So you will often see, you know, for example, a slight risk of tornadoes when you have a landfalling hurricane or a landfalling tropical system. So yeah, good question. Yeah, they they are interconnected. Um, uh, certainly, they're they're not uh, mutually exclusive. Excellent. We have um, another question from Hugo about, as you mentioned, that those storms that came through on Sunday uh, led to some pretty heavy rain in areas around here and surrounding areas like the Hudson Valley. Do you remember if there was early warning for that? Yeah, so we had that, uh, the excessive rainfall outlook was highlighting that um, at least five or six days in advance, and then uh, flood watches. We're going up, um, I forget if they went up Friday night or Saturday more, Saturday during the day, but there, we had flood watches at one point in time, we had flood watches all the way from um, Wilmington, North Carolina, all the way up into Northern Vermont, um, just to kind of give you an idea of the scope of the large of this large scale system. So yeah, we did have 
uh, outlooks and watches. As I mentioned, the um, when I was talking about the excessive rainfall outlook, we actually had a moderate risk uh, in the excessive rainfall outlook for much of New Jersey. Um, and I, I'm not sure because I'm, I don't cover New York, so I, I can't can't remember, but I think they were also in the moderate risk. Um, I know Vermont, which if you haven't heard, they they got especially hard hit. Um, they've got major, major flooding up there. Uh, they were actually in a high risk in the excessive rainfall outlook leading into that. So yeah, there there was some uh, early, uh, some uh, certainly some some signals very early on uh, for that event. Okay. We've got another one for you, sir. And I guess I'm a little timid on asking you this one. It says. Have there been any studies comparing the accuracy of the National Weather Service forecast with the various commercial ones? And as a Philly TV station claims to be the most accurate in the area. There's a lot of ways that you can um, calculate the, uh, so yeah, we, we keep stats on how accurate we are. Uh, primarily our focus is on watches, warnings, and advisories, uh, or specifically warnings. Um, yeah, you know, because that's that's uh, where where we get the um, you know uh, our our most critical things. Um, but when you when you see something is saying about most accurate, how are they? You know, there's there's a question of how how do you calculate that? Are you calculating based on maximum temperatures? Um, compare and you know which stations you are. So there have been plenty of studies, but um, as with so many things with statistics, it all it's all about how you calculate it. Um, and uh, and I don't know specifically because we're the only ones that issue official watches and warnings. I don't know specifically, you know, that's the statistics I've been most in tune with. I don't know. I haven't looked at uh, some of the studies with regards to like uh, forecast temperature accuracy and stuff like that compared to um, compared compared to commercial forecasts. So I don't know the the answer to that one. Um, yeah. yeah. And everybody always remembers the missed snowstorms, right? They never remember the one where he got <laughs> hammered. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> There's a, another more specific question from Hugo. He's wondering about um, if there's high humidity in the air, but there's no rain, does that prevent drought? Um, the only thing I could say is that that in case, in some cases, like when you're talking about a um, um, a reservoir that may be, you know, the uh, water source for a, an area, that would reduce the amount of evaporation from that reservoir. Um, so that might pre prevent the level of the reservoir from dropping very much. Um, but in and of itself, for a broader area, that would not have much impact um, on preventing drought um, because you're going to get some, maybe some dew, uh, you know, in the mornings with that. Uh, and that's really probably not going to be enough to even measure. Um, so doesn't really, um, aside from, from allowing reservoir levels to stay steady, it's probably not going to be enough to make a significant impact on, on drought prevention. Okay. I, I had a question. It was interesting to hear how weather reporting might be changing based on social science research. Uh, is, is there a group either in the National Weather Service or in within NOAA, the larger branch that uh, is conducting research to improve like not only delivery, but also um, forecasting? Absolutely. That's been a big um, that's been a really big um, emphasis uh, of research, um, especially within the last like um, 10 to 20 years, um, you know, Prior, especially prior to the 1970s, um, when you looked at the field of meteorology, they're very science focused, which is good. It's it's still a very young science field when you compare it to some of the other more established science fields. So there's still plenty of science to learn. Um, but um, but there's been this emphasis that we need to also focus on communication. Um, you know, we talked about was there early warning with the Sunday event. You know, we knew that there was a signal there, but was the message received from some of the reports we're getting up north that, you know, not everybody knew that what was coming. And, and so there is a big emphasis on um, how do we communicate this um, to make it easier to, um, uh, 
to receive that that warning or receive that information. Um, some of the um, things we've done uh, with the, specifically for the National Weather Service just within the last few years, um, we've revamped how our warnings are structured. So they are now in bulleted format. They say, you know, what, when, where, um, very, you know, very kind of pull and read very quickly. Uh, whereas before they were more in paragraph format and where you really had to read it, which when you're talking about a tornado warning, for example, you want to be able to get that information, be able to understand it very quickly, know exactly what you need to do um, in, in a very short amount of time. So yeah, there has uh, been quite a quite an emphasis, like I said, especially within the last 20 years on the social science um, in combination with more of the uh, meteorological science, the, the hard science part of it as well. Sarah, I've got a question for you. We have the the state climatologist office here with the WeatherX network. Do you guys coordinate or work together on some of that those stations? Yeah, absolutely. We don't uh, work together as far as like um, you know they they are in charge of maintaining those stations um, and um, and they, they they know where they place it and things like that. Um, but we get all that information, which is very helpful. We really appreciate it quite a bit. Um, for those of you that don't know what we're talking about. Um, a lot of states have what we call state mesonet uh, networks, which are automated weather observation sites that have a lot denser network than the observation sites that the National Weather Service has, which tend to be just co-located with um, some of our bigger airports. Um, and so the, they, uh, these mesonet stations, which New Jersey is one, Pennsylvania is one, uh, Delaware has one, um, Maryland is coming on board with one very soon. Uh, so uh, they they help to kind of fill in the gaps in between the larger airports. And so we we rely on that data quite a bit. We use it when we're looking at, you know, um, if we have ongoing hazardous weather, we're looking at those OBS uh, very frequently to uh, see, you know, what, what they're reporting. Great. Uh, Sarah, in the, uh, another Sarah <laughs> uh, in the chat had a question about collaboration with any European agencies. Sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, so specifically looking at models, uh, I see the you know, European model mentioned there. So uh, first and foremost, we do uh, the, the models, the weather models that are um, generated by various uh, agencies around the world are often shared. We have access in our office. We have access to not only the, the American models, which is the GFS, the NAM, uh, HRR, um, and RAP are kind of the main American models. We also have access to CMC, which is a Canadian model, the ICON, which is a German model. Uh, the one that you're probably talking about, Sarah, is the ECMWF, which is a European model, uh, as well as a UK MET, which is you know, United Kingdom uh, model. Um, so yes, we have access to all of those um, models. Um, now, as far as, you know, what is, what, which model is more accurate? The reason that uh, you get a lot of, um, a lot of uh, um, people saying, oh, the Euro is the most accurate is that when it came to Sandy, Hurricane Sandy, um, the, the ECMWF, the Euro European model, was the first one to pick up on, if you remember, Sandy made a left turn, which went right into um, the New Jersey coast. Um, and that was the first one to pick up on that left turn. Um, so that's why it, it kind of got that reputation. That being said, um, since Sandy, uh, there have been major changes made to all of the models. They're constantly um, adjusting them, um, changing the, um, uh, changing the the equations that are used in there because we get more computing power, so we have more ability uh, to uh, do the 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 finer uh, computations. You don't have to make as many um, assumptions or um, you know approximations. Um, so that being said, um, in recent years there really isn't much uh, difference in the um, in the accuracy of the models. Um, they're all pretty much on a level playing field. Um, so, uh, it, it depends on the, the event. You can't say for sure that one event, you know, this model is going to do best for all events. Um, it's usually, uh, it's usually event dependent. Now, that being said, we talking about the broader question about, do we have any collaboration exchange of data? Yes, absolutely. 
Um, in addition to you know, the models that I talked about, um, there is something called the World Meteorological Organization. Um, and it was, it's been in existence in one form or another since the uh, 1890s. Um, and last I checked, it's got um, partner, it's got memberships from pretty much all but like about a dozen countries across the whole world. Um, huge amount of collaboration. Um, things that they collaborate on, including we have a specific, specific times across, across the globe where we call them synoptic hours. And everybody that has observational equipment makes sure that they take observations at zero Zulu or Greenwich Mean Time and 12, 12 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time or 12 o'clock Zulu. Um, and the reason for that is because of the models. You can have the best model in the world, but if you only have observations from uh, the US, then it's not going to have, it's not going to be very accurate because, of course, the atmosphere doesn't care where political boundaries are. So all these models are inputting observations from the same time from around the world uh, to get better accuracy. Um, so that's just one example, but there's a lot of um, a lot of a lot of room for collaboration with the World Meteorological Organization. Yeah. We have time for one final question here. We've got one here. It says, "Could you please explain why it is so humid on the East Coast versus uh, lovely dry climate on the West Coast? Both coasts are bordered by oceans." Uh, so the key, the key thing with the West Coast is that you have a mountain range that's pretty darn close to the coast. Uh, and anytime you have a mountain range, um, apologies if, if my video doesn't come through, but I'm going to have to use my hands to explain this. Anytime you have a mountain range, the air comes in and in, the, in our latitudes, generally the air is moving from west to east. So the air is going to come in. If it hits a mountain range, it's air has to go somewhere, right? So it's going to go up and over the mountain range. Well, guess what? As you force air up, um, it gets cooler. And so the precipitate, the moisture that's in that air precipitates out. Uh, it fall, falls out as precipitation. So in the West, you have um, portions of the Cascades um, that are very green on the side facing the coast, but then you go just a little bit inland and it's almost a semi-arid or arid climate uh, because you're on the other side of the ridge line. Um, we call that the windward versus the leeward side of the mountains. So that's why you can have, um, I think Oregon has some rainforests that are right there on the coast side um, just before it goes over, uh, goes over the mountain range and then you get into more arid conditions. You don't really have that on the East Coast. On the East Coast, for one thing, again, the, even though the, the primary direction is from west to east, also, our mountains are generally a little bit more inland compared uh, to to the west coast. So that that combination of factors there. Thank you very much, Sarah. You've given us a wealth of information. I didn't realize you guys had that many uh, resources available. It's, it's very very helpful.